let's do our work and try to advance it as best we can, understanding that we will not finish the job. We essentially run the race, we carry the baton, then we pass it to the next runner, and the next runner goes, and they have to carry it forward. Um, and I think it's important when you're young to, to feel a sense of urgency, but also to understand that's going to be, um, you have to feel comfortable with the fact that you're not going to solve a problem like climate change by yourself, on your own, maybe not in your lifetime. I was the President of the United States, which you, know, uh, you can debate, is that the most powerful person on earth? This is you know, top 10. You know, you're, you know I, I, had, I had some, some, some clout, some juice. <laughs> I cared about this issue deeply. We got a Paris Accord done. The first international framework to solve this problem over time. Even at the height of my optimism, finally getting it done, we finally signed it and everybody's celebrating, I knew that the s standards that had been set by each country weren't sufficient. But I took satisfaction knowing that just by setting up the mechanism, we had created uh, the ability to, over time, turn up the standards, turn up the demands, send a signal to businesses so that they started investing in more clean energy because they saw change coming. If I, had, if I had just looked at the science at the moment I signed the Paris Accords, I would, have, I would have still been despairing because it wasn't enough. But I understood, okay, I've, I've, we've advanced the cause, and now we're going to have to take the next step. And that's how change is going to happen. And it's, it's not just true for climate change. If you're concerned about poverty in your country, your country's not going to be you know, not poor overnight. If you're concerned about women's equality, women won't be equal in every society overnight. If you're concerned about disability rights or you know, uh, you know, anti-corruption or whatever it is, you will have more setbacks and uh, times when you feel as if you're not making progress than those big highs when you have this big success. You just keep on going. You know, and that's why I say you've got to be in it for the long haul uh, and, and be practical in understanding where can we take some wins. Because one of the biggest dangers that happens, I saw this in my own staff when I was in the White House, sometimes people felt if we didn't get 100% of what we wanted, ah, why bother? And they'd get very frustrated and they'd say, we, we can't compromise on this. We've got to get 100%. And the problem is that very rarely do you get 100% of what you want uh, because the world's too complicated. There are too many countervailing forces. So I used to say to my staff, I said, said uh, will this make things better? And if they said yes, then I'd say, okay, let's do it. Because better is good. Most of the time, the way the world's gotten you know, to where we are now is small incremental victories, not big sweeping victories all at once. All right? it's, it's, it's been the steady application of effort, innovation, new, new ideas, tested out, worked on a local level, a few people are helped. The ideas spread. Every once in a while, you'll get a big jump forward. But you know, the civil rights movement in the United States, everybody thinks that you know, somehow there was Rosa Parks, and then King made a speech, and then that was it. And we signed a law. I mean, people, even setting aside slavery in the Civil War, people have been working for decades, filing lawsuits and they had trained Rosa Parks so that when the time came, she knew she should be sitting in the bus and there were lawyers already prepared 
with the case to test it out and right I, I mean it, it that was the work of generations and it's still not complete so you can no you can't be discouraged you should take a day off if you feel too discouraged <laughs> you know right relax all right uh let's see i know this is so difficult so many so many uh important faces here uh young lady back there who's almost standing up because she's yeah, that's you yeah yeah because you were like ah, ah. hi mr president my name is aisha i'm from malaysia i would like to ask you a question um when was the last time you had an ego check and can you please share it with us the story about it thank you ego checks I get, I get one every day. I mean, uh, what, didn't Michelle say she, she wanted to push me out of a window? I mean, and, and let me tell you something. You know, I've, I've been up here defending the women, but guys, I just want you to know, if I had said that, man, I would have been in so much trouble. Um, uh, look, you know, the, the, the truth is that uh, um, you know, partly because I, I have a strong wife and two strong daughters who are not impressed with me at all. I mean, they love me, but they think, you know, I'm just another dad, right? And and who embarrasses them and makes bad jokes and, you know, uh, if I start dancing, they're just like, oh my God, and and so, so, uh, so I'm often checked by them. Uh, but also, one of the things, th this is another, you know, leadership lesson. I I, I was. I was good at surrounding myself with people who were willing to tell me when I was wrong or to question my assumptions or to say that I you know, hadn't thought something through. And if you don't have people in your organizations, your associates, who you respect enough that they will tell you when they disagree with you, then you are doing yourself a disservice. If, if all you have is people who are yes people around all the time, who uh, laugh at all your jokes and, you know, uh, say, oh, yes, Mr. President, what a brilliant insight. You were fantastic. Um, you know, you're not going to, not only will you not grow and improve, but you're going to make, mis you're going to make big mistakes. So, um, so that, that goes with what I was saying earlier about combining confidence with humility, right? You have to be confident enough to know that you don't know everything and you are going to make mistakes and you have to have people around you who don't feel like they're going to lose their job if they tell you the truth, right? Um, everybody here may have had the experience of, I mean, there are different versions of it, but, you know, you're about to take a photograph. It turns out you had something in your teeth, but nobody told you. Gentlemen, sometimes your zipper, you forget. <laughs> nobody tells you. <laughs> Ladies, you know, something's on your shoe, whatever, you know, or whatever. Um, you always appreciate it, I, I hope, when somebody says, hey, psst. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you know, that's a small version of what we all have in our work and in our lives. Um, so, I don't know, I, it, it, it just happens so frequently, it was hard for me to find one particular ego check. Um, <laughs> I, 
but but uh, you know, the good news is is that when you have a partner like Michelle who checks your ego, you also know that when uh, when she goes to bat for you, she says, you know, you done good. You know, she's telling you the truth, um, and 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 that means a lot. By the way, it it's. Uh, it is important to note, though, that it is not a two-way street. Michelle's rule, very early, we, we had been married. We weren't even married. We were dating. And she would, like, tease me all the time about my ears and my, <laughs> you know, my bad car and, you know, how I walk too slow and I talk too slow. And she's teasing me all the time. And one time I teased her about something. I don't even know what it was. <laughs> She got all, <laughs> she wasn't talking to me. It's very lonely. I said, well, why are you all mad? You're te you, you've been teasing me for months. This is my first little joke. She said, uh, listen, there's a rule. I can tease you. You can't tease me. <laughs> and we've been living by that rule for like 27 years. That's, that's the rule. So it's OK. I don't, I, I don't mind. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, man, it's, it's, it's so many interesting people. Uh, Young, young guy in the white shirt there, right there. Yeah. Thank you, President Obama. My name is Tim. I'm from Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were in office, you uh, mentioned a few times uh, that you really tried hard to be home for family dinners and for moments with your children. Um, and it's a question that often gets thrown at women and at mums. Right. Uh, but I want to put it to you. It's a, something we've been discussing a fair bit in our community groups how you managed to balance being arguably one of the 10 most powerful people in the world uh, and, uh, and raising a family, how you balanced uh, the idea that you wanted to change the world, like a lot of us here, as well as just enjoy time with people you loved? Well, it, look, it's a great question. I think we all have to deal with it. Um, um, I don't think there's a perfect formula. Um, I think it starts, though, with recognizing that on your deathbed, or let's, let's just say for me, on my deathbed, I, I am confident that the, I will not remember any bill I passed. I will not remember any speech I gave, any big crowds. I won't be thinking about the inauguration. I will be thinking about holding hands with my daughters and taking them to a park or seeing them laugh while they're playing in the water or, right? Like, that is going to be the thing that lasts. That's going to be the thing that sticks. That's going to be the thing that will give my life meaning is the unbounded love I feel for them. And conversely, I don't care how successful you are, if your children or you, the people you love are in pain and are suffering and are having problems, you, that will overcome you. I, I, mean, I remember when Sasha was three months old. Uh, Middle of the night, she started crying. Michelle and I, we were fortunate to have good health care so we could call a pediatrician. This doesn't sound like the usual crying. He asked us to check the top of her head. It turned out she had meningitis. We rushed her to the hospital um, because if it's not treated uh, quickly, you can have permanent disabilities. She had to get a spinal tap, needle in her spine. 
she's three months old. I have no idea what was happening during that period of time other than that. All right, your world narrows to that. That's all you care about. I don't care about climate change. I don't care about poverty. I, I want this baby to feel better, all right? So if you know, if you understand that, if you, if you have that sense, then you have to, ahead of time, kind of organize your life to think about, how do I make sure that these people who I love so much are taken care of? And uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. And it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be sacrifices, but it does mean that you have some sense of prioritization. So with me, I'll be honest with you, the reason that I was able to run for president was because I hadn't married somebody who was just cute but stupid. <laughs> I had this incredibly strong partner. As much as I was going to miss them during the two years I was running for president, I had confidence that they were going to be okay, partly because they were in a community, right? My mother-in-law, we had all, Michelle had all these friends and neighbors and people who could support and make sure that those kids were going to be fine during those periods of time that I was gone. Now, I felt an enormous loss, but I didn't, I, I knew that there wasn't going to be a permanent impact on them, partly because they were so young. One of the reasons we decided to I'd run for president that early was, frankly, because we thought um, it'd be easier for them to make an adjustment at that age than if, you know, they'd been teenagers and, ah, oh, then your dad's really embarrassing you, being on TV all the time, saying stupid things. Um, so, so, so I think that's part of it. Um, Part of it is recognizing that it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier with Maya. There will be phases in your life where you have to prioritize different things. There are times where it will be okay for you to just throw yourself into work because everything's in a pretty good place. There are going to be times where you have to maybe make some sacrifices on the work side because things aren't all okay at home. Right? If, if your child's having some emotional issues that have to be dealt with, you might have to say, you know what, I, I, I can't go to this conference or do this project right now. I have to take care of this. Right? And, and I do think you're right that generally men feel more comfortable not even giving that thought. Uh, I think that those arrangements are increasingly going to change as women say, I've got ambitions too, and I've got work I've got to do. And so, you know, uh, there's got to be some trade-offs for both parties, not just one party. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a privilege to, to love somebody that much and to make sacrifices for them, right? It, it, it's not a burden. It's, it's, a, it's a great gift. Uh, and you just have to figure out how to, how to manage it uh, in a way that, and uh, last thing I will say, this applies maybe more to modern societies, uh, big cities, et cetera. It, it, we all, Michelle and I always joke, like when we were kids, like our parents didn't pay that much attention to us all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I do think that part of, uh, this may not be as true, uh, but certainly in the United States, probably in places like Australia, um, you know, there's this parenting that is like, I've got to handle everything and schedule everything for my child. And there's, if they don't get into the right school or the, if they don't get the best grade or something that I'm, somehow failing as a parent, that, like the child, instead of just being a child, becomes like a project, right? And there's just like this, you know, um, that's, that's not good either, right? That, that's not what kids need. They, they need some space. 
So you, you shouldn't feel like you've just got to be with them every minute or else you're a bad dad. Uh, they, they, there will come a point where they don't want to really see you anyway. So, uh, you know, but, but you, they've got to have room. Uh, and, and, and that is, is part of what you should understand. So. All right, next, uh, let's see. I'm just, I've, I've just got to keep on going here. Um, look down here. <laughs> that, you, that's cheating. Okay, I'm going to look down here right next to you over here. That's a fellow Islander. Oh. <laughs> No, you got, you got, your, you know, you got your girlfriend, you know, <laughs> called on. That's good. <laughs> Half a day, President Obama. My name is Sheila Jack Babasa. I'm from the Mariana Islands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is regarding the military presence in the Pacific Islands. With the relocation of troops from Okinawa to Guam, mm -hmm. there is major impact to come for the Mariana Islands and it is very serious. Although we are a very patriotic uh, community with one of the highest per capita of enlisted service men and women, we have died and fought in US wars. We also value our culture, our community, and our natural resources. But we feel like we're at the table with Goliath. How does one prepare to negotiate and encourage Goliath to come to the table where we can foster cooperation and coexistence to support national security mm -hmm. while preserving our culture and conserving our natural resources. Yeah. Well, it's a, look, it's a great question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, since I'm no longer commander in chief, I can't just say, come on, let's go talk. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm now out of date in terms of all the processes and procedures that are taking place. What I think is true, and this is not unique to the United States, I think this is true for a lot of countries that have a large military infrastructure, is that, uh, the military often is not as mindful as it needs to be about its impacts on the surrounding community. Look, in Hawaii, you know, we, we still have uh, a whole set of issues around the military presence and training and uh, how does that affect uh, uh, surrounding communities. Uh, a general rule when dealing with organizations or institutions that are bigger and more powerful than you uh, is uh, You've got to bring attention to the issue so that you get allies, right? I think the average person in the United States is not aware of some of the impacts that base relocations may have on local communities. So one of the, your first jobs is to raise awareness. And hopefully some of the tools that you've been learning in these workshops have taught you how to do that. If not, then we'll get some stuff online. But uh, you know, the, the power of the underdog in, in society, first and foremost, is to be able to, to mobilize public opinion. Since you don't have the ability to just impose your will on someone, you have to get allies, right? I mean, that's what happened in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you had TV cameras showing people with dogs and fire hoses directed at peaceful marchers, which started changing attitudes, which in turn led the federal government to start taking different steps. Uh, I think as you are raising awareness, I think it's important also, and I, again, I assume that some of this has been covered in some of our workshops. If not, we got to get it online. Uh, you have to know what it is that you want and what's realistic. And you also have to make sure that your own group 
uh, you've worked out your differences in terms of what you want. Because my suspicion would be that even among islanders, there are some different views. Some people would say, oh, come on, because we think there's going to be more business or there's going to be more economic development or what have you. And there are others who say, we don't want this. And if you have those divisions and your agenda is unclear, then it will be harder for you to be able, in a unified voice, to project and tell a story that gives you some uh, allies and, and gives you leverage. So your, your primary tool is going to be initially to raise awareness, but that means you also have to have done some work internally so that you know both what your basic stand is. Is there? And by the way, when I say unity, it doesn't mean you're going to get 100%. There's always going to be somebody who's hustling somewhere. It, but it does mean if, you know, if, if you've got a, a, your basic group agreeing to a basic set of demands, you have to know what those are uh, going into it. And they have to probably be realistic enough that they're achievable. Right? Because if you just say no to everything, but it, uh, it, even by the way you presented uh, yourself just now, I can tell that you've been thinking about this. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of guidance or encouragement. All right. I've got now. I've got, a, I've got a hard stop in five minutes because I've got to get to Singapore and apparently the, airline, you know, the airport is only giving us a little window. So uh, I'm going to try to be quicker and I'm going to try to get in three questions in six minutes. So uh, number one right there, the young lady in the back. Yes, right there. You, 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 yep, you. Within the, the, no, yeah. Well, it's all right. Sorry, she got it. She intercepted. Go ahead. I'm so excited. Uh, hello, Mr. President Obama. Um, my question is quick. So What's your this name? Is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, first uh, about... What's your name? Oh, sorry, I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Yu Man from China. Uh, mm -hmm. I work for uh, Girls Empowerment and Gender Equality. So my question to you is, this is the first uh, Asia-Pacific leaders, and what is your hope to all of us? Thank you. Well, my hope is that, A, you've been encouraged, inspired, motivated to go back and do great, continue to do great things in your communities. B, that you recognize that you're not alone in your efforts. That there are people throughout this region, and by the way, people throughout the world who share your values and are going through the same struggles and have the same questions, so that now you can learn and support each other. Learn from and support each other. You now are part of a network that can mobilize each other for change. Uh, we'll try to formalize that you know, and create platforms that make it easier for you to, uh, to work together. We're going to try to... Uh, create subgroups around different issues and concerns that people have so that they can work jointly on various projects. Um, and then my hope is, is that as a consequence of being alumni of this, you're then out there also recruiting and energizing and encouraging the next generation and passing on whatever it is that you've learned so that in wider and wider circles, we have more and more young people like yourselves on every continent who are working together and supporting each other. And, and uh, in that way, uh, you start building a, a movement for change that can last because it's built on a sturdy foundation. So that's my theory anyway. We'll see if it works. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Right here in the front. Hi, President Obama. Hello. My name is Amalina. I'm the YCLE coordinator from Malaysia, and I love you. <laughs> Thank you. I love you, too. Uh, my question is, I feel like the world is getting more polarizing, and how do we get here, and how can we go from here? Well, uh, the world's... 
As I said before, remember, the world's been polarized, just not as polarized in our lifetimes. In some ways, you all were born at a, and this is not true, obviously, everywhere, right? I mean, some of you are, come from countries that have had recent violent conflict. But most of you were born and came of age during what is probably the most unusually peaceful, optimistic period right before, you know, 9-11, the Berlin Wall had come down, Mandela's released from prison, there's a sense of optimism. 9-11 changes it in the Iraq War, but there's still a lot of economic growth and globalization and standards of living in a lot of countries that hadn't experienced growth before, they're seeing it suddenly. And then you have the financial crisis, and it reveals all these contradictions between all the growth and expansion, right? You have greater inequality, you have uh, climate change, and, and what's happening is more and more countries grow at an accelerated rate, rate with higher carbon footprint. You have cultural displacement, where people suddenly, because of the internet and social media, you know, if you used to live in a, a rural village in Indonesia, you know, uh, you didn't see things that violated your ideas of the world, right? And now, just through your phone, you know, your children might be looking at things that you can't believe, right? And that you consider a threat to you. And the same is, by the way, it's not just in a rural village in Indonesia. It's in a rural farm in Kentucky, in America. They're seeing things that suddenly feel as if it's an affront to them. And then you have politicians who exploit that, right? So the way out of it, I think, is to deal with some of the underlying problems. When people feel more economically secure, they're less likely to feel polarized. You know, social science shows that typically voters are more generous with other people when they feel as if they're doing well. No surprise. When they feel stressed, pressed, insecure, they lash out and they're more vulnerable to messages of polarization and, and, and hatred. Number two is you know, young people have to participate in fighting back against uh, messages of hate and polarization, wherever you find them. And it's especially important for those who are in majority groups to speak out when they see minority groups being threatened. So if you are an Indonesian, then you have to be mindful of what's happening to people in East Timor. If you're Javanese, then you have to be able to say something about that. If you are from Myanmar, you know, especially if you are not Rohingya, if you're part of the Burmese majority, then you have to be able to speak out when you see Rohingya being threatened, right? So if you are, which isn't to say that those communities don't have their own voice, it just means that you, have, uh, you also have an obligation because they're gonna need allies, just like we all do. All right, uh, I'm not gonna get to three. I'm gonna, I, I only have time for one more or I'm gonna get in trouble. So this is the last question. Um, I've got, you know, it's really tough when it's the last one. Uh, I'm tempted to call on the guy with the Obama hat, but that's probably, but, that, but that's too, that's too self-serving. I shouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> how about the guy next? No, no, right there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right there. No, 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 the young lady, right there. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think leaders here makes difficult decisions all the time. Yeah. I, my question to you is what has been the most difficult decision you ever made in your life and how did you make that? Could you share that with us? Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, 
Look, uh, I would distinguish between the most difficult question and the most important questions. Right? I already told you what the most important question uh, or decision I had to make uh, was uh, who to marry, but that wasn't that hard. Uh, I, I will tell you, I, I think probably as difficult a question as, as I had to answer was whether I should run for president. Um, we had a young family. I had taken Michelle through a series of races. I had, I had lost one. I had won one. We had just kind of stabilized um, financially because my book started selling after I was elected to the Senate and I spoke at uh, the Democratic Convention. Um, it was a good time for everybody to catch our breath. The girls were happy. We, had a, we were in a new house. Um, frankly, there were some other strong candidates. I didn't, uh, it wasn't as if I had to run in order for necessarily Democrats to be successful. I, um, so I struggled with that. Um, and I had asked myself, why me? How was it going to affect my family? And then could I actually win? Um, and uh, I concluded I could win. I concluded that in conversation with Michelle, the family would be OK. And then the, the, the hardest question to ask is, well, why you, other than just your ego? Right, to the ego check question. Um, and I concluded that, that given the time, the moment, it might be that if I was successful as uh, someone from a historically discriminated against group that was able to rise to the most powerful office in the world, that in addition to me advancing a policy agenda, that I might send a signal to people about what was possible and uh, to young people and to children and, and to help uh, people reimagine themselves and their societies and that that might be worth it if this was probably the best window for me to do that. But it was still hard because it was still going to involve a lot of sacrifice. Um, You know, the, the decisions I made during the presidency, uh, there were just a series of decisions that were really tough. Because as I said before, usually the rule was, if you're a president, the only questions that actually come to you for a decision are the ones nobody else can solve. So when I came into office and the financial crisis had happened, and we had to make a series of decisions about how are we going to save the banks, and how are we going to stabilize the financial system, and how are we going to save the auto industry? Each of those questions, you were dealing with percentages and probabilities, because there was no guarantee that any one answer would work. So you had to make decisions about these issues based on getting the best information possible. This to your question, how do you do it? Being open to all points of view, getting good information, Discussing it with a team that's willing to challenge your assumptions and challenge each other's assumptions. But then at the end of the day, you have to feel comfortable that you set up a process so that when you make the decision, you know whether it works or not, at least you did it the right way. Um, and I was, I think, good throughout my presidency, whether it was dealing with the financial crisis or dealing with, you know, how do we deal with bin Laden or and terrorism or, you know, and, and by the way, some decisions that were painful, and not, I still to this day am not absolutely positive I was right. Like my decision not to launch another military intervention to stop the bloodshed in Syria is an example of just a hard question. We had been involved in the Middle East in some war for over a decade by that point. And I didn't think that us intervening again and occupying again another Muslim country in the Middle East was going to lead to a better outcome. And yet, there were children who were being slaughtered. And you had a, a government that didn't care about displacing millions of people. And 
the question, you know, what responsibility did we have for that? To this day, I can't tell you for certain the decisions I made were the, around that issue were the optimal ones. All I can say is, is that, that I set up a process that I believed in, where it's, I asked all the hard questions and was willing to face hard truths and look at the data and the information. And that's, you know, uh, I guess, is a good place to conclude just by saying this, because uh, it goes to a lot of the questions earlier about how do you not be discouraged and how do you deal with when you feel like you're dealing with Goliath and how do you find balance? And you're young to, to all these questions. Um, if, if you set up uh, a way of, of being in the world and, and uh, interacting with the world in which you are honest and truthful, not just with others, but with yourself, if you're willing to ask yourself hard questions and to challenge your own assumptions, and you know, if you're willing to, to continually say to yourself, okay, I say I believe this, but is this what, what I'm actually doing? Is this what I actually believe? Is, a, a, am I living up to uh, my ideals? If, if you're doing that and you're trying and you're working hard, and you you get up when you make mistakes, and you sustain effort, and and you also forgive yourself when you make mistakes, and or sometimes when you're just tired and you've got to take a break. And if you're surrounded by people who are honest with you and support you and share those values, um, then then you should just. Rejoice in this opportunity to change the world. It's a great.